Um, today I'd like to introduce in just the most high-level overview kind of way the notion of chaos. And I think chaos is a good thing to introduce um, just because it's a kind of modern mathematical feat. I mean, most of the material you learn as an undergraduate is quite old, quite classic. I mean, the Jacobian was first used in 1852, and it hasn't changed since. Um, Chaos is a modern field, and that's because the study of chaos heavily relies on computers and simulation. So it wasn't possible until that technology came into its own. So chaos is kind of an anomaly in mathematics. I mean, normally mathematicians want everything to be very well defined. I mean, you can read like set theory books that will spend hundreds of pages defining like addition and subtraction and what is zero exactly in a formal sense if you were going to define it purely in terms of abstract symbols that have no relation to the real world. Um, in a setting like that, if chaos is going to be a major field of study, one would think there would be a firm definition of what it means to be chaotic, and that is not the case. You just sort of if you look at people talking about chaos, eventually sort of general trends emerge and you get an idea of what people mean, what mathematicians mean when they talk about chaos. And where specifically, of course, this is a differential equations class, what makes a system of differential equations chaotic? And when you look at attempts to answer that question, three themes emerge. The first theme is going to maybe seem a little uninteresting, just because we've never really looked at randomness in this class. But I think I did mention, you can have um, what are called random differential equations. And there are mathematical ways to include noise in a system of differential equations. And in a sense, a very noisy system is going to be very chaotic. But the feeling is, well, if the system is just acting in some very predictable way, and all of the chaos of the system comes from the fact that you've dumped a bunch of white noise into the mix. It's not really the system that's being chaotic. You just added a bunch of noise to a well-behaved system. So, we don't want any random variables or any randomness in a chaotic system of differential equations. If, 
if everything is converging to fixed points or converging to periodic orbits, that's not chaotic at all. I mean, that's what we saw with the Locke Volterra system, for example. So most and I put that in quotation marks. I'm not going to try to formally define it. But most trajectories should not converge to a fixed point. or an orbit. Because if the trajectories of the system are converging to fixed points and orbits, again, what's the chaos? As time passes, um, the animals go extinct and we approach either this fixed point or that fixed point. It's, um, it's not a chaotic behavior, but these trajectories also shouldn't go to infinity. Because I mean if you look at a if you look at an unstable node, like you look at a linear differential equation where the eigenvalues are both positive. I mean everything is going away from the fixed point. So stuff isn't converging to fixed points, it's not converging to periodic orbits, but it's not really chaotic, is it? I mean, everything sort of just goes to infinity along parabolas. So that's not it. This combined with what we talked about yesterday, means that chaos is a three-dimensional and higher phenomenon. Because if trajectories aren't going to infinity, then trajectories are trapped in some kind of trapping region. And according to the Poincaré-Bendixson theorem, in two-dimensional space, if you're trapped inside a trapping region, the stuff we say trajectories shouldn't be doing is precisely the only thing that trajectories can do. So chaos cannot exist on the plane. You should see sensitivity to initial conditions. Um in the models we've looked at, the details of where you start don't really matter. Like if you look at the Locke Volterra predator prey model, you've got a fixed point, and if you start with this many predators and this many prey, Now you go around the fixed point in a closed orbit. And if you start with a slightly different number of predators and a slightly different number of prey, 
then you go around the fixed point in a slightly different orbit. So slight changes in where you start result in slight changes to what happens as time passes. Um, to see chaos, we want the opposite of this. We want situations where even when um, we start at two really close locations, maybe one trajectory spirals in and the other trajectory goes off and does something complete different. And the classic example of a chaotic system is named after its discoverer, Edward Lorenz. Let's give a little historical context. So, I said that, that this is a new field, which is true up in a sense. Edver, Edward Lorenz made his sort of interesting discovery in 1961. So, new enough that people are alive now who were alive back then, but it's, I mean, new in mathematics and new in, like, the historical disciplines mean very different things. So he was a mathematician working in differential equations. And he was a meteorologist. He wanted to try to predict the weather. And he was looking at a weather model which included 12 variables. So, of course, um, this weather model wasn't, uh, wasn't really functional, but the hope was that they would refine it, and they would make it better, and they would be able to look at things like current temperature and current wind speed and all of that stuff and predict the weather in the future. And he was running this model with one of those computers that you see if you watch old sci-fi, those sort of enormous room-filling things. And at one point, They fed some data into the computer and they ran a simulation of this system of weather equations and weather variables. And they got what they got, okay? So it, it worked fine. At some point in the future, they needed to rerun the simulation. I'm foggy on why. Maybe they wanted to double check something. Maybe they were worried they'd made an error. But they reran the simulation 
and they got a completely different results. So the same simulation with the same initial conditions and the same variables, but they ran it twice and they got different predictions. And I mean, the simulation did not have any randomness in it, no random variables, so it wasn't that. And they said, I keep saying they, I mean, Lorenz gets the credit, but obviously all of this is done on a team. Mathematic mathematics is a very collaborative field. So Lorenz or whoever, I mean, their first idea was, well, there's an error then. I mean, differential equations are deterministic. If I give you all a question on the homework, you all should be giving me the same answer, and you should all be making the same predictions. But they couldn't find this error that was supposed to be causing this. And eventually, they realized what happened. The first time they ran the simulation, their initial conditions were rounded to six decimal places. The second time they ran the simulation, They rounded their decimals to a different number of decimal faces. They rounded it, them to three decimal faces. And that amount of rounding completely changed the outcome predicted by the system. So, I mean, of course it was from the point of view of their project, it was absolutely ruinous. I mean, they're not going to be able to predict everything with perfect accuracy if an error in the fourth decimal place just completely destroys their system. Their system is unusable. So this kind of weather prediction had to be given up on. And I mean, obviously, weather prediction has only improved. They found ways to do it that didn't involve looking at systems of differential equations. But they recognized that this project was not viable. And what the Wren said, not famously, but the Wren said, well, we can't do simulations like this. I mean, everything is so delicate that if a seagull flapped its wings, it would completely change the weather patterns we predicted. Uh, in conversation, a friend of his suggested that maybe a butterfly is a more attractive and picturesque animal than a seagull. And this is how we get the often misunderstood butterfly effect. And I mean, I say it's often misunderstood because the point Lorenz was making was that that isn't true. I mean, a seagull can't 
sap its wings and cause a tornado. The fact that the model allowed something like that to happen means that the model is bad and has to be scrapped. And a lot of people who have heard of the butterfly effect, but don't know its origin, seem to be taking it as a reflection of reality. Like, appear to really believe that, that this is true, and a butterfly flaps its wings, and the weather changes. Again, that's that are really the opposite of what Lorenz was saying, but for better or for worse, it certainly entered the um, public consciousness. So Lorenz asked himself, um, well, Twelve variables, presumably twelve equations. That's a lot of variables and a lot of equations. I mean, maybe not so much by modern standards, but he wondered, is this chaos that he saw? I mean, he hadn't, he didn't use the word chaos. Chaos hadn't been coined in a mathematical context yet. But he essentially asked whether the chaotic behavior of this system of differential equations was caused by there being so many differential equations. If you could have a small system that exhibits this kind of behavior. And he and some colleagues of his, although, again, the unfairness of naming conventions, only Lorenz is now famous. He or they found a system of three variables and three unknowns, which now bears his name. It's called the Lorenz system. And we're not going to attempt to study the Lorenz system. I mean, Honestly, studying the Lorenz system is well beyond my ability, but I can write it down. And what I'd like to say as I write it down is that the, the Lorenz system is not complicated looking. Dx dt is linear. Dx dt is as simple as a differential equation can be, more or less. Dy dt isn't linear. It's not linear because it has an xy term. And dz dt also has an xy term. And what I explicitly want to say, I mean, these xy terms are the only thing that are stopping this system from just being a, a linear system that we could explicitly solve using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But we see terms that look like this all the time in this class. 
the Zotkovo-Terra predator-prey model had an XY term. The Zotkovo-Terra competition model had an XY term. The model um, of armed conflict we looked at. Both models, conventional and guerrilla warfare, they had XY terms. The SIR model had an SI term. So, terms that look like this show up all the time in systems of differential equations that are not that complicated, but of course those were two-dimensional systems, all of them. None of them could be that complicated. What happens in the Lorenz system as time passes? I've claimed that this system is chaotic. So, if trajectory shouldn't be approaching fixed points, they shouldn't be approaching orbits around fixed points, and they shouldn't be going to infinity. Well, as t goes to infinity, initial conditions do approach something, but it's not a pure, it's not an orbit. And it's not a fixed point. It's some kind of indescribable shape that now also shares Lorenz's name. It's called the Lorenz Attractor. And let's look. I mean, here's a trajectory of this system of differential equations. We start somewhere in this mess, and we look at what happens as time passes. So these blue lines are all the same path that um, some initial condition is now traveling along. And I mean, you see some, I mean, pattern. By the way, I, I have, I've never read this in like a textbook or anything. I would bet almost anything that Lorenz's friend was looking at this simulation when he coined the phrase butterfly effect, because that's what it, it looks to me like a butterfly. So we sort of, we orbit around these blank spaces, but after orbiting these spaces, we then break off and we go to the other wing and we orbit that for a while. And then we come back and we orbit this. And there's no pattern that I think people are aware of. Like you can't, okay, you'll go around here five times and then you'll go around here six times and like nothing like that. It's just a very chaotic trajectory. And What about this sensitivity to initial conditions? This is, this is what 
Lorenz was, and his team was observing here, changing the initial conditions in the fourth decimal place, changed the predictions of what would happen. Now, let me... Claim no credit for this. It's not my video. I don't know the guy who created it. I'm just using it. But here we have an initial condition, or we have two initial conditions. We've got a yellow point and we've got a blue point and they're sort of scrunched together, so that together they're forming this single ball. And we can ask what happens as time passes. Our video playback is stuttering, you would but there we go. So they stayed together for a time. You would think a college's internet connection would not be foiled by YouTube. Let's see if we can get a cleaner... They start together, they come across, for a while they're sort of sticking around, but at this point they have come very far apart, and now they're sort of moving, for heaven's sake. Now, this distance between them is going to increase and decrease at random. Suddenly the yellow ball is making these orbits around this wing. I mean, you see that they're basically disconnected at this point. You see, like, yellow ball in this ring, it's it's changing so fast, it's hard for me to really narrate it. But those are two initial conditions, remember, that were extremely close to each other. I wonder if, I mean, I can give a uh, concrete example. I wonder if so it just says it just caused these slight changes in the initial condition. I can give a concrete example. So we have some sigma and some rho and some beta. And we've got an initial condition 8, 8, 27. Negative 8, 8, 27. Then we've got another initial condition, negative 8, 8 point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 27. And we'll run time up to t equals 40. And this first point will now be at 8.03. 2.61, 32.41. Sorry for kind of the scrunched up writing. The second point will be 
nowhere near that. Negative 2.54, negative 0.64, 23.87. So, I mean, this is not, of course, the weather system, but this is what the rent was seeing. So, the rent and his team, they ran the first sim division, or let's say they ran the first sim division with six decimal points of accuracy. To run the second simulation, they rounded to three decimal places, and it became this. And you see that that rounding error completely changed the prediction. So, more equations and more variables, but this is what Lorenz, what Lorenz was seeing. And that's our introduction to chaos. I called it cultural enrichment, but I want to say there's some kind of brief homework assignment on it. I honestly don't remember, but it will be in your calendar if there is. And we'll find stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about that isn't in the textbook, but which is still interesting. We might do, might do a two uh, class crash course on discrete dynamical systems or something, but we'll find something to do during the last week.